You're listening to Death of the Reader here on 2SER. This is your Murder Mystery World Tour, and we are here with our third book of the year, Herds. Oh my goodness. Nio Marsh's opening night, or Night at the Vulcan. Depending on what country you're in yes. and your, you know, general ideas of what you'd like to read. Yeah, I was looking for Night at the Vulcan to try and find a copy of this book, and I could not find it for the life of me. And opening night is what it's called. Yes. Australia, apparently. So, yeah. Now, I think that Night at the Vulcan is just a better, I agree. better title by I agree. a country mile. So, for the sake of this, I think we should just call it Opening Night at the Vulcan. Opening Night at the Vulcan? I like it. I like it. I like it. It's nice, and to the point, it really gets a... Uh, Gets the feeling across. There's nothing yeah, yeah. quite like dragging a title out to make it longer to improve your story. <laughs> Shout out to High School, the musical, the musical, the series. Oh my goodness. It's a terrifying That's man. a real show. That's terrifying. <laughs> I've never watched it. I've <laughs> I, only seen the first High School musical. I was I was unimpressed, I'll be honest. Wow. Fight me. All right. Well, <laughs> we are talking chapters one to five of yeah. 11 today. Yes. Almost half the book. Um, um yeah, so Flex, I have a bone to pick with you. I imagine you have <laughs> several. You've given me a, a murder mystery, supposedly, and there's no corpse. There's no corpse. Um, there's no detective. There's no detective. There's no corpse. Uh, Alan is is nowhere to be seen. But was, it is a Roderick Allen was, book, and he I is in the promised, Dramatis Personae. I was promised an Alan. And this, uh, let's be clear, in the Dramatis Personae, there's not only Alan, but a whole list of like 10 different like policemen and detectives. I, th- I think and, it's like, only forensic. five, but yes. It's, it's a, it's a, look, it's a great big number. It doesn't matter. The point is, it's too many. Um, and we haven't seen any of them. Uh, the novel seems to take a great deal of time. And I like this, by the way. I, I appreciate this, um, at least in terms of the novel, not in terms of how you've given me a puzzle to solve, yes, but no yes. puzzle. But. It takes a great deal of time to set the atmosphere of the theater. Um, and I've, look, I've been in a couple of theater companies myself, more or less. Yes, And yes. let me tell you, it is so to life, like the feeling of being uh-huh. in a brand new theater, not knowing where anything is. And so like understanding the culture of the place. And I think that Naomi Marsh does a really excellent job of carrying across that feeling of expectation because we have the expectation of like a murder is going to take place. But also... Yeah. It's opening night, and we got to be good, or else we're going to get banned by critics, and then it's going to suck for the theater. You know? Yeah, I thought that it was particularly fun. If oh. you if you haven't been keeping up with the show, our previous book was uh, Naomi Marsh and Stella Duffy, uh, Money yes. in the Morgue, which was a very theatrically written murder mystery by mm-hmm. Stella Duffy uh, from 2018, uh, finishing off a story that Naomi Marsh had started during World War II. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to bring you over to this as an example of a, a typical murder mystery by sure. a Nio Marsh bringing forward a lot of those theater concepts that were prevalent in Stella Duffy's work so that we could kind of compare and contrast the two. So I love it. over the course of this in the next couple of weeks, we're not going to spoil Money in the Morgue for you, but we will be making some comparisons to it. Yeah. So it's probably worth your time uh, catching up on that on the podcast. You can get that up at 2SER.com or any of your favorite podcast platforms. No, it's it's fantastic. I um I can definitely see No Marsh's theatrical background and Stella Duffy's background dripping with you know both of these books. Yeah. Um, you can see that there's a lot of not not just a lot of knowledge but a lot of passion put into the opening night at the Vulcan here. Yeah, I think the one thing that was particularly interesting about those stage antics is that in Money in the Morgue we had a lot of completely unrelated to stage incidents framed as on stage moments. Mm. Whereas kind of, we have the opposite here where we have a lot of behind the scenes off stage moments yes. that are framed in a very kind of conventional, uh, I guess, thriller kind of way. For sure. There's a lot of scenes like particularly, you know, um, and I suppose we should raise this. There is a, it's yeah, the, there is a rape scene in this yep. book. It is, it, it is out of left field. I wasn't even sure it was it, happening it, when it, occurred it's insane it is forgivingly short yes if one could say such a thing about um, such a scene it's only one paragraph but it's really just there to like show you how terrible the characters are yeah um which they are by the way um and i think that's very true to life uh no shout outs to theater companies but like the entire culture of like we're all here to put on a show and some look sometimes you work with really wonderful people mm. jacko is one of those wonderful people he is a a wonderful artist who isn't actually an actor funnily mm. enough but so, a lot of the times when you when you join these theater companies you join these like these cliques you'll find there's a lot of you know back background politics that you're not familiar with mm. um, and it can be quite daunting to try and try and tackle um and i definitely think that the way that no marsh has set up the 
the very play-like conflicts between the different characters um, is very true to life in some ways. Yeah, and I, I do think that there are some moments, particularly like that scene, which the book just gets very gratuitous with the way that it's describing yeah. things. And I think that kind of also plays back to what you were talking about with the language, where it's mm. it's very much feeling that, you know, Tolkien, Clancy-esque vibe, where it's like, why say it with three words when we could say it with 30? It's very strange. Um, and I was trying to figure out what a shift means. I know now. It's ridiculous. <laughs> but yeah. So th- the interesting question here, though, Herds, is that mm. we don't have a murder. No, well, we don't have a corpse. We do have a murder, though. We, but look, it happened a year ago. Look, oh, you mean that murder that was five years was ago? It five years ago? Oh, apparently, my goodness. It's been too long. I feel old now. Yeah, apparently there was a murder that occurred five years ago in the theater, and it was via uh, the, like gas pipes that like lead. It's like the heating in the in the uh, actors' like you know dressing rooms. Yeah. And there's these pipes that go between them, and apparently uh, one of the actors, like, you know, turned on the gas in one room, uh, which is connected to his, like, friend's room, and then let the gas, like, spill out in the other person's room, and then lit a match, and so it just had, like, a huge explosion. Yeah, I, b- um, I believe that the technical description of it is that they're meant to be, like, gas lamps, but yeah. if you blow hard enough on the other end of the tube, it will put the flame out but continue pumping gas. Something like that, yeah. It was, it's a very weird concept for me to wrap my head around in this age of electrical, you know, magic space magic but there's a device that can you know, blow a bunch of gas into the into the actor's room and that's uh, how this murder was carried out five years ago um and it seems important like we'll, we'll get on to methods of murder in a little bit but yeah i i'm not sure if that's going to be the exact method by which we get our kill mm. um who as as i was going to say earlier i think he's going to be bennington just by there is a paragraph that just says you know this person is bennington this person is bennington he is he is getting he's getting killed in some way or another. I don't know if the if the the gas itself will be part of the murder though. I feel like that's just way too like obvious. Mm. Um, and also, it's not a very like actor. It's not a very theatrical way of of murdering someone. But we'll we'll talk about more about that in the third part. Now, I suppose before we get into the third part, herds, mm. I do have to say we are doing double or nothing this year, which yes. means that whoever doesn't have the lead on points by the end of the year gets no points, and every sure. book is worth two. Sure. Now, I I wanted to pitch this to you, Herds, that okay. because there is no corpse in the first week, okay. if you can figure out what happens next week and the solution to uh, the uh, implications of next week, okay, you get a point for each. Uh, so uh, okay, sure, I'm I'm down for that. All right, I don't know that I can do that. This has been sprung on me at the last minute, but I'm down for it. I'm ready. (laughs) Oh, my God. I think the other thing that was really weird to me about the story is, you know, there's a lot of time that seems to be spent building up the theater as a character. Yeah, totally. um, Which is a very interesting choice because the character seems to be, hey, I'm old and decrepit. (laughs) And if you look at, like, the blurb for the book on, you know, on websites or if you have a physical copy on the back of it, oh, my goodness, that was the most millennial thing I've ever said. (laughs) Um, (laughs) That's all right. We're all millennials here. That's debatable. Um, if you if you look at the blurb for this book, mm. uh, you can you know see that the blurb has a lot about oh you know the theater's on its last legs and it kind of sells that mm. part of the story. Well, what's interesting in in that note, bringing up the cover of the book, the mm. the cover that I'm actually looking at here, uh, it has a like poster for the 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 play that's being put on. It's called yeah. the Revisit or something like that, mm-hmm. um, and it implies very much that not only are we going to revisit the murder that occurred five years ago in some way, shape, or form, yeah, um, but that the the theater itself was being revisited because it was, I think, it was shut down after that murder. At the very least, it you know suffered financial troubles, yeah. And this is like, it's not just that it's on its last legs. Um, this play that is occurring tonight could like you know, breathe new life into the place. It could be a new beginning. Um, in theory, you know, I mean, you know. Burn down a horrible gas fire. Oh, my it's God. It's also possible. Wouldn't that be an intense way to Th- Then we'd lose off. our set piece. So, you know. I suppose, I suppose. Anyway, we'll you're listening to Death of the Reader. We are Flex and Herds here on your Murder Mystery World Tour with Opening Night at the Vulcan by Nio Marsh. <laughs> what is it, Herds? You're not Opening a, Night at the Vulcan. No, I like it. I like it. Stick in with it. You have to. You should re- leave a review on the podcast, by the way, if you're enjoying the show. Let us know which title you prefer. <laughs> <laughs> we will be back in just a second. You're listening to 2SER. 
You're listening to Death of the Reader here on 2SER 107.3. This is Flex and Herds, your murder mystery world tour as we discuss Night at the Vulcan or Opening Night by Nio Marsh. I think you mean Opening Night at the Vulcan. Oh, yes. Let's be real here. That's the, that's the true title. Complicated names, <laughs> many difficult issues, but Herds, it is mm. a show within a novel. Mm-hmm. And that means mm-hmm. that we have brought on the stage man himself. Oh, I self-proclaimed see. Self-proclaimed friend, friend of, the, of show. the show. I remember. I remember this guy. He was he was excellent last time we had him on to talk about mostly Final Destination, if I recall correctly. Yes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we got Andrew Fallon, friend of the show, and also, uh, I would say, a, a worker at, uh, at 2SCR now, working on Monday Drive. Part How of the doing? team. Yeah. That's right, it's me. I'm going to try and find another way to contrive a connection to badly written horror movies here. Just you wait. <laughs> I'm ready for it. I'm ready. So the last time Andrew was on the show, we were talking about The Last Temptations of Templeton, your show, which was phenomenal, by the way. Hopefully we're mm. going to be seeing a recorded version of that available sometime soon, sometime I pray. in the next year would be, be good. Yeah. Because I want to relive it. It was <laughs> truly wonderful, and if you get the chance to get your grubby hands on it, by all means, do. Andrew, congratulations on that show. Thank you very much. The The, the recording's still a work in progress, so uh, I'll get back to you on results. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we are discussing a novel that is set in a theatre as a play written f- supposedly around the time that the novel begins just mm. starts to go awry as a cast member dies and people start to turn on each other and relationships go wild. And Herds was saying before we sat down to do today's episode that a lot of the backstage politics that goes on in this novel is very indicative of the kind of things that he's experienced behind the scenes. And we wanted to bring you on, Andrew, to kind of talk about behind the scenes politics yep. and what it's like to be backstage on a production basically like that. just validate everything I've, <laughs> I've already thought and said so uh yeah behind the scenes there, there can be a lot of um a, a lot of sort of drama and egos that you kind of got to juggle um doing kind of what role you're in whether you're an actor or director or producer it's sort of taken differently uh i do i do think that in a lot of scenarios kind of the amount of um drama that's sort of depicted backstage can be exaggerated but in a in a team where there's just not a lot of communication uh or you've just got certain sort of personalities that just really don't gel with others there can be some serious like butting of heads and that can seriously impact the show in your experience working on the stage how does that actually portray itself in the performance do you find that those egos will ever actually end up changing the way the show appears to the audience or is that kind of part of the the tact and skill of the actors to be able to to keep the backstage separate I mean, ultimately, uh, any like good actor will do their best to stay professional on stage. People come in, they pay, pay money to see the show. Mm. That said, it, it does, whether they're aware of it or not, it does affect chemistry. Mm. Uh, it, it affects sort of interactions. If the leads, for example, just really don't get along, that can seriously impact the show, especially yeah. if they're not characters that are meant to be constantly conflicting with each other. Um, that said, you can get some interesting side effects where yeah. during those sort of fight scenes, you get that vitriol going at each other and um, it's a... It's a very convincing performance, let's say. Yeah, I mean, I think that from what we've seen, I mean, you know, the cast of The Last Temptation of Templeton were obviously getting along absolutely swimmingly because they were just having an absolute hoot even when, you know, slight things would go on, on go wrong on stage. It'd just be like side glances and smiles about what had happened. And then, you know, for example, when we saw Knives Out at the end of last year, it was so obvious that the cast in that film was just having a good time. Mm-hmm. And it really, like, elevated the production. Mm. And I think it's really interesting to look at how no, this novel kind of, as we've said on the show earlier, portrays the theatre itself almost like a character. For example, when we saw The Last Temptations of Templeton, it was at the Red Rattler here in Sydney, which mm. is a very dingy, small theatre, which just so fit the tone of the play. And it's really interesting how the space can kind of also work within the production itself, you know, aside from just being a platform. Mm. The Rattler is a fantastic community theatre. I would strongly recommend it to anyone who's wanting to put on their own independent productions, whether it's um, theatre or performance, live music, anything like that. It's a very good spot for it. The space can have a lot of impact on the audience's sort of reaction to the show. Uh, When you go into an amateur theatre, whether it's the Red Rattler or if it's a student theatre like the Lighthouse here at Macquarie or the the Cellar Theatre at Sydney Uni, uh, you have an expectation that this show isn't going to be like huge glitz and glamour. It, it, it might be pushing the limits of what amateur theatre can be. And, and a lot of musicals um, with, with good budgets and directing teams can do that. Um, but you, you're not going in there expecting like, you know, Bell Shakespeare. You're not expecting like the, the top notch of performance. But when you go to say somewhere like the Opera House um, or the Enmore Theatre, 
where it is professional production, uh, when things start looking very shabby on that side, it's less charming and more aggravating because you paid a lot of money to see them. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to cast blame, but there was a show I actually saw at the Opera House recently where I was like, you could really pull this off for schmackles in a small theater. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was it was still a really great show, but it kind of <clears throat> it left that question underneath. And I think that, you know, to some extent, it's, you know, you have to consider it as a piece of the scenery for the play, mm. you know, particularly when we start looking at the theater in, you know, the Vulcan here, it's obviously got this very dingy, dark, foreboding atmosphere and rats crawling around. And we never really get to see like the full tone of the play. We obviously get scenes with it, but, uh, and we'll see a bit more of that coming up later on the show as well. Mm. But it's such a, a strange like way to set the, the tone. Obviously it's a murder mystery novel. We have death, we have despair, we have detectives, but there's like a horror tone going on mm -hmm. with the way the theater's presented and that's mm. a really yeah. interesting dichotomy. As a, as a director, you, you absolutely have to have a good knowledge of the theater space you're operating in. Um, knowing the, the scope of it, the size of it, the kind of audience you're going to get, the, the type, like the demographic of kind of people who turn up in that area, makes it makes a huge difference to the quality of the show. Take the Lighthouse, for instance. It's built out of an old warehouse. The acoustics aren't great, but the space is huge. It's bigger than a lot of professional theaters. Um, and so you can get away with a lot with that stage that you couldn't get on a smaller stage, such as at the Rattler or at the Cellar Theatre, uh, which are much more suited to very um, sort of compact um, shows uh, with, with not a lot of moving scenes and all that. Whereas at somewhere like Lighthouse, you can have big sprawling sets so you can have um, you know different scenes take place on different parts of the stage because you just have the room for it. Um, and so like having a good knowledge of where you're performing can make a huge difference to blocking and, and directing and just the quality of the show. Yeah, and I will say, uh, having you know performed and been in the audience at the Lighthouse Theatre, I know that rain is a particularly a particular problem. <laughs> there have been several performances that you just you just can't hear anything. The actors are doing their absolute best to project properly and carry the scene, but if it starts to rain, just a little bit of ticklet on the roof there, it it ruins any scene. It was actually a great time in a show at the Lighthouse. Um, it was during one of Drama's Godzilla productions. Basically, Godzilla is just a bunch of amateur student plays put together like short plays in in, mm. in a um in like an omnibus for lack of a better word. There's a better word for that. Uh, anyway, but there was a there was a show that was all about how it was really hot and like it was really humid and terrible. Um, at the end, they're like, oh, it's raining, and they're meant to be celebrating. It was pissing down the entire night. <laughs> and oh, so it it's raining, raining and they're having this quiet scene where they're trying to talk over it. And then at the very end, they're like, it's raining. And the audience just lost it because it was raining the entire time. Like the fourth wall was yeah. being constantly broken down mm. by this torrent outside. Mm. Yeah. Um, the Lighthouse is a major exception to that rule, though. Most theaters have not tin roofs. Yeah. yeah. There's a certain sense of camaraderie that can come out from, you know, living and breathing the same space, especially for, you know, troops that travel from place to place, putting on shows at different venues, that sort of thing. Um, uh, and that can bring a certain uh, life to a performance, especially if you get along well with the actors. Um, would you say this to be more often the case, or is it more often that you tend to find people kind of sharing the same same theater space, whether it be you know in that troupe, you know, living in a grungy hotel together, uh, or or cohabiting just a theater space? Do you think that's more more often than not a positive thing? Oh, very much, very much. Um, especially with amateur theater, you get a lot of very tight knit communities. Uh, that can sometimes get a bit clicky, but uh, overall, it's it's over all a very strong and positive experience. You get actors that are that really develop just because they've been working so closely together for, for, for weeks or months um, on end. Uh, they can develop a very strong um, connection. Uh, and that can be uh, highlighted either by a very good production team uh, that like you know, organizes cast bonding nights or they do things that just keep the um, the actors sort of uh, interacting with each other and acting in, in more than just a professional space. Mm. Um, but it can also happen perversely when you have a very disparate like production team. Uh, where you've got a team that's uh, almost butting heads with the with the cast and 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 then the crew, uh, they can kind of band together in a solidarity of okay, let's just get through this. Mm. Let's just like the director <laughs> sucks. The show is kind of a train wreck. But if we just like stay professional and do the best we can, we can make something out of this. L luckily, it takes more than just one bad director to ruin a show. Mm. Um, like I think it needs a lot of incompetence to truly tank a show because it's it's theatre. People are passionate about this. Yep. Uh, you, you just, people will, will, the show must go on, as the old saying goes. And indeed, the show must go on, which is why Andrew were back to evict you from the studio and to get back to opening night at the Vulcan by Nio Marsh. Thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Do keep us informed about where that recording of The Last Temptations is, both because I desperately need it and because we'll share it out once we know it's available on our social media channels at Flex and Herds, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thank you very much for joining us, Andrew. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on. And we'll see you around. You're listening to Death of the Reader. Yo.
you're listening to Death of the Reader. This is your Murder Mystery World Tour. We are flexing herds here, reading through Opening Night or Night at the Vulcan by Nio Marsh, or Opening Night at the Vulcan. There it is. As we're going to be calling it. We are discussing chapters one to five. It is the part of the show where herds, the blind man, mm-hmm. leads me around by the hand in the dark. Yeah, that's the plan. I. Look, I'm not going to claim that I can solve it because I don't even have a, I don't even have a corpse. Um, I can probably tell you who's going to die, though, uh, if that counts for anything. I think I think if Do you can guess who is going to die, that will be worthy of a point. Really? Uh, I'll take it. But you know, we'll see. We'll <laughs> see. Maybe okay. Bennington is too obvious. What? And I didn't I'll, say anything about. Wes I'll have to include his method. What? Oh, already. Uh, all right, sure. I mean, I've got lots of notes about that. Let's see if I can if I can crack this open. Yeah, I mean, um, obviously, going into this book, especially given uh, the the rape scene, which we are unfortunately going to have to talk about when we're talking about Bennington. Not not too much, hopefully. Uh, not too much. It is it is a very short scene. Um, it's literally like two paragraphs, anyway. and is is not really done directly, but it's still. It feels out of place unless yeah. the man is going to get his comeuppance for it. Yeah. Well, this is the thing. As I mentioned in part one, there is a there is a page where we are literally told everybody's like motivations mm. for for murdering Bennington. I can't remember them off the top of my head, but it basically just says, you know, this character has a row with Bennington over over the casting, and this character has a row over this and that and that. And then in Bennington's uh, in his scene, actually, yeah. when we get it from his perspective, and he's like going home to to Helena, he says, you know, I've been having rows with. As particularly uh, John Rutherford and, and Adam Poole, mm. who I find very suspicious in this situation. Um, but, like, the novel does not make any uh, kind of... It doesn't make a mystery out of who's going to be killed, especially for someone who knows all the tropes. Usually, uh, you know, a very kind of stereotypical aspect of, you know, trying to solve the murder is that you'll give every single character, every important character, a reason to kill the the murder victims that you have a larger pool of suspects to choose from mm. um and the question is less who had motivation to kill this person and more or, or rather who has motivation to dislike or to distrust them or to have a row with them um but who is motivated enough to to go beyond verbal arguments or even physical ones and actually murder the man yeah um I think there's also some interesting uh, room in here for Bennington to be the killer. Sure. That that said, I, I'm going to say that Bennington dies, uh, and there is one very simple reason for that. What is that? Um, sh- sh- the, there's a prop gun um, that is used to fake a suicide, it seems. To, on, to, on stage on for stage, the performance. Yes. For the performance, Bennington walks off stage, uh, one of the stage players fires a gun, I think in the air, but possibly at him. I'm just saying, if that gun does not turn out to be a real gun by the end of the story, I'll be very disappointed. The um, old, quite literal Chekhov's gun. Yes, uh, that would be an excellent method of murder. Um, because let's let's put it this way. We've we've mentioned this like gas business, but if Naira Marsh, the queen of crime, doesn't use this as an opportunity to kill someone with a very theatrical flair, I'll be very disappointed. Um, the other method that is quite uh, quite an easy one, uh, I would say, is is poison in in an actor's makeup. Mm. Um, quite a lot. I, I don't know that I've actually read any stories where this is a trope, but I know it's like it's it's a it's a well played trope. Um, it's, it's probably a very poor example, but the first one that comes to mind, I believe, is Goldfinger. <laughs> I don't know James that I've Bond. seen that. I don't know if I've seen that, but I like it's a very easy way logically yeah. to introduce poison in someone's system. Just like when you're painting them up before the show. Put some poison in there. Put some like like heavy dose of arsenic or something. Let him go on stage. Like that mm. stuff like glistens in the lights anyway. Like nobody's gonna notice. It's like a slightly different yeah. substance. Um, it'll soak in your skin and you'll be you'll be it is, horribly. It is a very um, uh, a very anti Nox method to use such a device though. A, is it? It's not a very complicated idea. It's just poison. I suppose it is. But it's just an unorthodox method. I don't feel I mean, that we've necessarily had it introduced if that's going to be the case. Maybe. But I um I, I definitely think that of of those solutions, I think that even though the idea of like poisoning someone through their makeup has not been, you know, necessarily foreshadowed mm. in this novel, I don't think that's a terribly foreign concept. Yeah. Um I think that especially if you're reading a, a novel that is about plays um and that draws attention to like the art. Um, one of the, uh, themes that actually is very like 
one of the visual symbolisms, I suppose, that's very present in the novel um, is that we are constantly seeing Martin, uh, we're seeing her face like reflected in in imagery, um, mm. which is very, it very much brings to mind that idea of a mask. That, yeah, like, even, even the portraiture around the theater is kind of described very like yes. reflective. Yes, the idea of like the image that you display to the world not being the same as the person you really are. Like that's something that's part of the play itself. Mm. It's between Adam Paul's character and, and Gay's character. Um, it's with all the times, like even in, I think the, the very second chapter, maybe in the first chapter, mine is seeing her reflection, like seeing her reflection, somebody else's reflection. Like, oh, that's, that's weird that we're seeing each other's reflection. Like the good old gas and mirrors. Well, I, look, I don't know as we gas involved in this, but, uh, like th- this idea of reflection, mm. Uh, it would not be a, a big stretch to say that the literal mask of an actor, the painting or the powder or whatever that they put on their face, uh, could be used to poison them. Yeah. I think that would be very in keeping with what we've seen so far. Yeah, I, d- I don't disagree, actually, now that you've pointed out that foreshadowing. I would have said that there wasn't much active imagery suggesting that that's the way that things were going to go. Yeah. But when you kind of reframe those images as foreshadowing mm-hmm. towards a potential method. I, I def, Look, I definitely think Bennington is getting it. Uh, mm. I'm not sure. I think that uh, it's either got to be the poison, the makeup, or the prop gun trick. Um, though, of course, whichever that ends up being is going to heavily influence my decision on who, who the killer might be. Um, mm. That said, I will not suspect him because he's a lovely man, and I think this is deliberate. This is Naomash playing with my heart. Jacko is in a perfect position to take both of those murders and carry yep. them out because he has access to the props. He's a, he's the prompt guy. Like he also does all the like painting of people's faces and all that stuff. Like he does everything backstage. He's, he's the, the guy that the you get. To, he's the guy that you get to the end of the novel and you do the Ocean's Twelve yes. flashback scene where it explains well, he how he actually everything. did everything. He literally could. Like, this is the thing. Jacko, I think, because I'm approaching this with love, Mm -hmm. because I have to, I think he's far too nice. And at the end of the day, I don't think that he would kill Bennington because that would ruin the show. And I don't think that's in his best interest in any way. Yeah. Um, But uh, he he does have the means. So I've got my eye on you, Jacko. Don't, (laughs) Don't you mess up. Don't do this to me. (laughs) I think this is very fair. Herds. Yeah. I, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing with your proven right. So you're going so, with Bennington's going to be killed. Yes. By <sighs> final guess. Pro, 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 uh, I'm look, just cause of the imagery, I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with the makeup idea. All right. I'm gonna go with that. Cool. And I, I don't think it's Jacko though. I think it's probably going to be Paul. I think that that's the angle that the story is right, gunning right. for. I'm not going, I'm not going to sit you hard line on a point based on whether it's Bennington and the mask. I'm, I'm interested to see. Sure. You know, we can hash out next week whether we think your your solution was worth that point or sure. not. I'm into it. Because it's it's very interesting to look at a book like this and say, like, hey, this is a big departure from the standard structure. Mm-hmm. And, you know, how do we as murder mystery readers interpret this uh, this style of approach towards yeah. the game? Yeah. Because obviously, particularly when we're looking at golden age murder mystery novels like this, as we spoke with Jimmy Van when we were... Uh, discussing murder on the Orient Express, a lot of Golden Age authors were very big into the game, but this mm. seems counter to it in a lot yeah, of ways. Yeah, Marsh is clearly a character writer, um, yeah. clearly interested in exploring these relationships between people, um, less focused on the puzzle, which mm. I really, like, this is very much the kind of murder mystery that I enjoy yeah. reading, so I appreciate that. And I think <laughs> it really goes to show, and we'll definitely have to get into this more next week, but I think it really goes to show why an adaptation like Money in the Morgue was as successful as it was, because mm. Nio Marsh already reads as such a modern writer, For sure. structurally. But either way, that is this week on Death of the Reader. We have been talking in Nio Marsh's opening night or Night at the Vulcan or opening night at the Vulcan to us here. All three. All three <laughs> of them on to a CR. I don't even know what we're going <laughs> to pick for the for the thumbnail for these episodes, Herds. Just pick all three. Just like shove them all one line under the other. <laughs> maybe hide them. Hide them like in the image. Done. Just do like one of those slashes through the screen with like the, the close-up eye effect. Yeah except it's a book cover. It's a book cover. It will look great. I, I have absolute faith in this idea. You're listening to Death of the Reader. We are Flex and Herds. We will be back with chapters six and seven next week. Just six and seven? Well, there's only 11 chapters in the book, uh, Herds. I can't give you just the entire rest of the book. Just two chapters out of 11? That's not enough. That's that'd be, be a, There better be a lot of clues in these two chapters. That's all I'm saying, Well, Flex. hopefully there'll be a murder. Hopefully. <laughs> there better be. 
Some call him a manager. This is Death of the Reader. You're listening to 2SER.